What I mean is that I would say, how can we do something for ourselves that is good for us as an organisation, good for us financially, good for us emotionally, good for us creatively. And if we do all that, all the other stuff will fall into place. Yeah. Business of Architecture UK, episode 45. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And what a delight I have for you this week. This one was a truly inspiring conversation. I had the very good fortune to go down to Reading University and catch Piers Taylor and discuss with him about how he's grown his practice, how he's developed his career, how he's kind of entered into the media and how he's become such a, a force, an advocate for architects and how he's been able to communicate what architecture is to the mass market. And he, for me, he, he really is an inspirational uh, man, he was so open, he was so eloquent and articulate in the way that he described his journey and also very funny and witty. So for those of you who don't know Piers, Piers is a renowned, he's an award-winning architect, he's a broadcaster, he's an academic, he's um, had a few television series, he presented um, The World's Most Extraordinary Homes, which was on BBC Two with Caroline Quentin, and that was in that was back in 2018. He's also co-presented The House That 100K Built, again that was on BBC Two, and that was a program that was really demonstrating to self-builders how to do more with minimal budgets um, and that, that was an incredibly successful television program and again really starts to open the conversation to a wider audience about the power of architecture. Piers, he's also presented Britain's Most Spectacular Backyards um, and he's also you know he's won a number of architectural awards. He won the Reba Award um, for Room 13 and the House Moonshine, which won the AJ Small Project Award. He's been published extensively and internationally. And he's founded, he's gone through the process of, you know, I've been involved of two practices, founding two practices. First of all was Mitchell, Mitchell Taylor Workshop and now um, Invisible Studio. And he'll tell the story of how of the sort of the inception of both those businesses and he's also a former design fellow at the University of Cambridge and a studio master at the AA. So Piers is you know a tour de force for architecture and in this interview I think the thing that really inspired me was how Piers was really speculating and demonstrating a new way of practicing architecture, a new form of architectural practice that was a lot less risky, that was a lot more accessible, and ultimately a way of practicing architecture which is deeply fulfilling and that really crosses the boundary between work and play. So you're not able to distinguish between when you're working and when you're just living life. So without further ado, sit back and enjoy this incredible conversation with Piers Taylor. No, no, you didn't, you didn't have any kind of formal schooling as such. I did have formal schooling. I went, well, I went away to school, but I was expelled finally. I was expelled at 14, expelled at 15, and then expelled finally at 16 from these three different schools. Can we ask what you got expelled from? Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I just kind of being not, it wasn't a kind of critical event, interestingly. I was, I was, I was told I was um, uh, you know, uneducatable, and, uh, and I, it was, I was incredibly naughty, you know, I was disruptive, and I was bored at school, and in a way, didn't like being in that context, mm. and when I left, um, I guess I didn't know what I wanted to do. My parents were very academic, actually. It was the only thing they knew, was that you'd go to school, they'd gone to Cambridge, my brother went to Cambridge, and I didn't think I wanted to be part of that world, you know, and yet I didn't have the confidence even to know what architecture was. And I went to Australia as a 22 year old, um, having gone to art school, having set up a construction company in London in the eighties. I went to Sydney mm. because my ex-girlfriend had gone over there and just gave me a call saying, you'd love it over here, why don't you come over here? My dad for my 18th birthday had given me a one way ticket to Sydney. And so I phoned him up and said, can I have that one-way ticket now? 
And I went out there and my first child was conceived on a beach, one night stand, and realised, you know, three or four months later that my ex-girlfriend was pregnant. And I was like, God, I've got to get my life together. So I enrolled in university in Sydney to do graphic design. But I went to a university, went to UTS, where the first semester was a shared semester, graphic design, industrial design, and architecture. Right. And fashion, actually. Uh, it, was, it was what had been Sydney College of the Arts. And the first lecture that I went to was by Glenn Murkett. And I was like, wow, that's my roadmap. You know, yeah. that's what I want to do in the world. That's the lens through which I can see the world is architecture. So I came out of that lecture and went and changed to architecture. And that was the roadmap that I still, to a certain degree, carry with me, you know, 30 years later. Mm. So when you, uh, when you came back to London yeah. um, and you went to the AA, and then when was it that you started up your own, your own practice? How did that, how did that begin? Because you've had a really interesting career and you've diversified and you've kind of been operating your own larger practice and you've kind of, you know, you've let that go and then started up now the Invisible Studio, you're active in teaching, you're, you know, you're, you're in the media a lot. Um, how, did it, how did it begin? I moved back to London in 96 and rented a tiny flat in um, Marble Arch, went to the AA and then split up from my girlfriend. And in a way, I realised two things in a way. One, I was unhappy in London. Two, um, I didn't have anywhere to, for my child then to come at the weekends. It was a tiny, scuzzy little room actually above a pub in Marble Arch. And um, realised that part of the roadmap that Glenn had given me was that you could do interesting things in strange places. You mm. know, and actually, when we were in Australia, you know, we'd go out in the bush to do interesting work because land was cheap, there was space, we could build, we could make stuff. And instinctively, that's what I did here. So rather than thinking of the home counties as a sort of place of absolute conservatism, I saw it as land, it was space, it was cheaper, you know, I could move west. And so I moved west to I needed to be within an hour or so of London hour and 10 minutes of London and I wanted to go somewhere with a bit of space so I moved and rented a tiny little cottage that was 40 pounds a week I remember at plus two hours a week gardening for the old woman that lived next door and had a had a place to make stuff I was making big stuff at the AA anyway I had a place for my daughter to come at the weekends you know and I realized then that there was a way of life and practice that could exist in this country out of London because every single model of practice that we look at in this country historically has been from London, really. Yeah. You know? So the great heroes of architecture for the last 50 years, you know, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, whoever, have all been in London, Zaha, you know. And, um, but going away, I'd seen that there was potentially something different, you know. And I then um, met my current partner, Sue, you know, we had more children, all that sort of stuff. So we just kind of ended up staying west and gradually moved closer to Bath. And uh, cause Bath, you know, there were two universities, there's bigger practices like Field of Clegg, there's mm. bigger Happold, engineers. And curiously, I lost my way a bit. I kind of ended up working for a local commercial practice. And in, in hindsight, it was a very good discipline. You know, I learned how to put big working drawings packages together. I learned the discipline of practice. But I was really unhappy creatively. Yeah. And this was like just at the beginning of the internet. Someone sent me an email saying there was this masterclass in Sydney. This was like 2000, 1990, 2000, I think it was, that Glenn Merkett was running. And I immediately signed up for it. You know, I think it was five grand, a huge amount of money, you know, and phone up my dad, borrowed that from him. And went back to do this masterclass in 2000 with Glenn Merkett, Richard Leplastery, Peter Stutchbury. And that was the catalyst for me coming back. We um, bought the place we live in still, which is a place that then didn't have any car access in a woodland close to Bath. And I then started doing my own work. You know, I was kind of renewed my, I guess my kind of faith in a way of practice that could mm. be um, different from the quite commercially driven British practice model could exist uh, here. What, what, what were the sort of lessons that you learned from Glenn Murcott, not necessarily in terms of his design, but the way that he practices? So Glenn had almost no overheads. You know, he worked out of his house. Um, he 
worked in a way where he did everything himself. He mm -hmm. did his own drawings, he answered his own phone. Um, there's a kind of lack of ego in some ways, you know, where he worked in a way that meant that he didn't have to be beholden to keep winning the wrong type of work. Mm. He could afford not to be busy if it meant that um, he could wait for the right project to come along. And the kind of dignity with which he practiced was extraordinary. He knew what to say no to, he knew how to work. He was unafraid to say to his clients, this is what I need. If I'm going to work with you, this is what I need to be able to work with you. This is a relationship of equals, of adults. You know, I'm not just a, a lackey that can do what you want. You know, we need to come to this together. And this is what I need to sustain me. Mm. And Glenn, more than any other architect I know, has been able to kind of express that. So that was immensely powerful and potent to see that. And those other architects like Rick, Richard Laplastre, yeah. who is a contemporary of his, practiced in the same way. And so did Peter Stutchbury, you know. So curiously, you know, I set up a practice and, well, I started working by myself and eventually I set up another practice that became different from the vision that I'd had initially. And I went back curiously to see Glenn and Rick and Pete Stutchbury in 2009, 2010. And I remember them saying to me, what did, what happened? Why did it, why did you move away? And I realized that how unhappy I, I, I was becoming with a mode of practice in Britain. You know, I'd fallen into again, a way of practice where I was taking on more people. I was trying to win bigger work for lower fees. I was trying to keep an office busy with the wrong type of work. Mm. And so again, they, made me realize that I could change the way I was operating as a, as a practitioner. That's really interesting. And what, what do you, and, and I know many young architects will often, I mean, I can say for myself, you know, I had this dream of being like a, doing sort of Jeffrey Bauer types projects in beautiful landscapes. And then the realities of when you set up practice is that you're on, you feel like you're on the back foot and you've got to say yes to everything. What was it for you, do you think that now in, in like being able to reflect upon it, had you end up kind of straying away from your initial sort of vision or the, the kind of, you know, your sort of almost your spiritual architectural path? I think I was lucky when I was practicing at Mitchell Taylor that I really did two types of work. Mm. On one hand, I was pursuing the work that I was interested in. I'd set up this thing called Studio in the Woods where, you know, my partners were saying, why are you doing that thing? It's not earning us any money. But that thing led me able to get a teaching post at the AA. Get a teaching post at the AA meant that I became their architect doing buildings for them down at Hook Park. You know, we set up the Design and Make program where I was the architect for the big shed and the caretaker's house and one of the student lodges. And that work came out of doing things I loved, you know, yes. working a different way, working with my friends, working, you know, in rural contexts with timber, that kind of stuff. And on the other hand, um, I ran an office, you know, 14 people, and I was doing quite a lot of developer work, which completely fell apart in 2008. And I guess in 2008, I felt very exposed, very vulnerable, mm. that, you know, the world that I depended on for kind of easy projects didn't exist anymore. So we're taking on developer work because it was quite low risk, it was quite easy to do, it was quite a good fee, but it was very, very insecure. Mm. And I realized I didn't want to be beholden to that. I didn't want to feel as if my world could be exploded, you know, like it was in 2008, really financially. You know, we had to lay people off like everyone else. You know, we survived, but we paid ourselves very little. You know, I saw friends laying off, you know, two thirds of their practices. And I realized then, very soon after, that there had to be a model that allowed me to focus on the things that I was good at and the things I really wanted to do. Yeah. So that model was Invisible Studio, where instead of being a small rural practice, the idea of it was that it was a kind of international practice. I could work anywhere, in any context, with any people, had no geographical fixed location. We could be any size. And I realized in order to do that, I needed very few overheads again. So, you know, moved back into my house, um, let go of my office, and I did everything myself from, you know, a back bedroom. Then I also realized I wanted to build, you know, I wanted to do work, but I didn't want to be enthralled to the market. So we built our own studio as the first sort of expression of who we were. And that is the studio that I still work out of. You know, it's called Visible Studio because it's an outward manifestation of 
you know, who we are. And that was a project we built for 15 grand. So it was kind of next to no money. You know, you can almost build it on a credit card. Mm. But doing that project by ourselves, for ourselves, you know, got on the cover of kind of, you know, 20 magazines, whatever it was. And it was a sort of outward statement of doing things differently. Mm. You know, it just used the materials that had grown on that bit of land. It used labor that was unskilled, you know, used all my neighbors in the valley, that kind of stuff, uses, used materials that was kind of salvaged and was a kind of manifesto for how we wanted to do things differently. It touched the ground very lightly, you know, and um, that also made me realize that alongside the projects that were fee paying, we could be propositional and do our own projects that were kind of advertisements for who we were. So the projects that we have done that are self-initiated projects are in a way have, have done as well for us as the projects that have been commissioned. You know? Right. So we did the studio, we did the long drop, we did the ghost barn, we did the trailer, we did all these projects around where we are. Um, and the investment I made, I suppose, was to buy the woodland, to buy the land. So we bought the land quite cheaply. You know, we bought, you know, we bought a big piece of woodland very cheaply at commercial forestry rates that was attached to our house. Mm. And that became a place that I could experiment, a place that I could invest emotionally and financially in the knowledge that it would benefit me as, a, as an individual, benefit my family, but it would also benefit me, my practice, my organisation, you know, that I could build there for nothing and it could, in a way, promote my practice. Right. So, so do these projects, do they draw in like a, a, do they have like a direct revenue stream or they become more like your sort of, yeah, like examples of work which you then use to kind of promote a bit of a, both, actually. So the studio we built, you know, I paid for it. It was, um, as I said, fifteen grand, and you know, I funded it because actually what had happened in the interim was that I was renting another office space from a neighbour, you know, and I think that was actually it was kind of big space. It was fifteen grand a year, and I realised that I could build somewhere for the cost of a year's rent. So part of it was a commercial decision that I needed psychologically to be out of the house. It wasn't good for me to be working at home. And um, I didn't want, again, to have someone with lots of overheads. Mm. So built this place, you know, that has paid for itself many times over now because I'd have, you know, it doesn't cost me anything. The other projects, some of them have cost almost nothing. So we built the long drop was a tiny little kind of toilet for the studio. And it was just, it went <laughs> var, it was on everything. It cost nothing. And that is the most recognizable project that we've done. And you know, that's one work. I mean, you know, it cost nothing. It took us a weekend to build and it's one work. You know, mm. We then built the ghost barn for a few grand where we prototype stuff. We then built um, something called the trailer that is a relocatable house. Again, it cost me 20 grand to build it, but um, we now let it out. You know, people rent it from us, you know, they come and... Uh, so again, it, it, was a, it was a commercial decision to build it, but it has paid for itself in terms of the profile it's given to us. Mm. And also it has its own income stream now as well. I think one of the key things for me as an architect was that I wanted to be less reactive so if our model historically was that we'd wait for the phone to ring, a client would say, I want you to do this. What I mean is that I would say, how can we do something for ourselves that is good for us as an organization, it's good for us financially, good for us emotionally, good for us creatively. And if we do all that, all the other stuff will fall into place. Yeah. You know? What I mean by that also is that the commercial projects that we've won, so things like Western Bert Arboretum, you know, we did two buildings for them. They won a national award. You know, they were shortlisted for the Stephen Lawrence Prize. We got those projects explicitly because of how we worked in our own woodland, in our own context, with our own materials and people. We explicitly win work because of what we do for ourselves. Yeah, because you're demonstrating something very unique. Exactly, as well. exactly. And, and so how does it work in terms of your company, your office structure then? Like with your, with your employees, is it a kind of typical nine to five type of environment or? No one's nine no. to five. So I work all the time, but I'm also not working all the time. Yeah. You know? So I'm at home, I'm working, but I'm also able to put the phone down you know, in the middle of the day and go and do things with my kids or go and do things wherever. So I have no distinction between my work and life. I'm constantly living, but I'm constantly working. And for me, that's a good thing. Yeah. But, you know, I like my work, I like my life, and the two things are kind of intertwined. Every project is a collaboration. So I don't employ anybody now at all. Every single project is a collaboration with somebody else who is either on a cut of the project or a fee for a certain bit of the project. They can then work in any way they like. So one guy I work with a lot 
Tara is delivering three or four big projects for me, with me. He's on a cut of the project and he runs them autonomously from his place. He has an invisible studio address. He lives in the next valley over. He comes in and out of my place, you know, for meetings, for, for stuff. But he works, you know, runs that bit of the project mm. autonomously. And Kate, I did a lot of projects with Kate Darby, who is an architect in her own right, has her own practice, based in Hereford. The way we run those projects is that I will pay her a small proportion of overhead for what it costs to use a bit of that office, which is doing other two other projects, two other practices, sorry, her, pra her practice and her husband's practice, and Invisible Studio. And then I will... Um, Kate will be on a cut of the project for a management if she's managing a student or something in her office and then that student will be on a, a fee for whatever they're bringing to the project. So there's, there's a very different model from, you know, I pay you 24 grand a year as a student to be in my office from, you know, nine to five or seven till ten, whatever it is. I mean, even know. just hearing you speak about this is making my chest just... Oh, okay, yeah. That, that, it, it sounds accessible. Um, fun, quite fulfilling. Less risk for everybody. Yeah, less, some of it is less risk. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have that kind of the weight that the traditional no. architectural practice has, and that also that we're all, you know, we're going like maniacs trying to accomplish as well. I think also, you know, when you take on somebody who's a student, it's something for me infantilizing about just, you know, you're a student, this is your role, and you know, you're working from nine to five. But if you say, okay, so I'm going to pay you 10 grand to do this bit of the project over however many months, and actually you've got to take this on as a fully fledged, autonomous, creative individual with responsibilities, they're totally engaged in it. Mm. And, you know, the comers are kind of equal, and it works really, really well for me in that we're all invested in the project then. We all want it to happen, you know, and um, it's a much better thing than you know, someone getting to the end of the month and saying, oh, I've run out of time, you know, I'm going to need another month, whatever it is. So it's a better creative model. It's a better emotional model in terms of people's well-being. It's also less risk for everyone. We all know how much everyone's getting paid from the beginning. And, you know, of course, we can revisit that, but there isn't that sense of a project being stuck in working drawings for months, just, you know, because the person that's doing it approaches it as a kind of entrepreneurial, creative individual thinking, you know, as you arrive, I've yeah. got three months to do this. I'm going to do it, you know. And how, do, and how, does, the, how does the relationship with your clients then alter than, say, the more traditional role of the architectural practice? I think most of them get it, actually, and understand that we still, as professionals, have a huge amount of responsibility. You know, when you take on a project, anything, even a back extension, it's a big responsibility. You know, you are acting professionally. We have professional liabilities to that client for that project. And in a way, as long as we fulfill those professional obligations, they're less interested in how we work and where people actually are day to day. And curiously, you know, other practices, I think, are beginning to work like that. Mm. So Tara, who works with, also does work for Field and Clerk, you know, Stanbrook Abbey, Sterling's shortlisted project was delivered kind of in that way, you know, as a Field and Clegg project. And yet Tara was, was kind of, you know, working with a Field and Clegg address remotely doing that project. So I think more and more people are realising that you don't need to be all sitting in the same space as we were in 1950. Yeah. All in our little worker suits doing something, signing up to that organisation. We can be, you know, free agents. Yeah. And, and so how does, because you've diversified as a lot as well, you, I mean, you're, you're active in education and also in the media, how do those roles fit into the Invisible Studio? So yeah, I do make TV programmes and I diversified into TV again as a way of surviving the recession. Right. Know, because I realised that I wanted to be able to do more than just respond and do buildings. Mm. And also being an architect as you will know, is doing more than designing buildings. It's talking about architecture, it's thinking about architecture, yes. it's explaining what architecture is to people. And I was really interested in that, you know, taking architecture to a kind of wide, mainstream, non-architectural audience. Mm. So I was asked by the BBC initially to do a project called The House of 100K Built. And I think what was interesting for me and Kieran Long about that was that you know, if you have, um, you know, a little bit of money, but not that much, you can go and buy a nice pair of shoes, nice phone, nice car. You, you have no exposure to what good architecture is. That's a world that is exclu excluded from you. 
And what we wanted to show initially was that good architecture doesn't have to cost any more than bad architecture. Mm. You know, design thinking can actually save you money, but you know, you don't spend money on things to make them good. You think cleverly about things, you know, about relationships between materials, space, you know, whatever. And at the other extreme, I've made this show called The World's Most Extraordinary Homes that is in some ways a privilege because you get to travel to see really interesting pieces of architecture that in some ways are exclusive. You know, people don't have any access to that yeah. financially. And what I suppose I'm trying to do is say, well, actually, maybe these are kind of national trust places of the future. And if we can democratise them by showing them to all sorts of people, explaining what makes them happen, explain again that design thinking isn't about how much they cost, it's about what they're like, how they're designed, how these spaces are constructed, mm. that will infuse our day-to-day -day conversation about architecture. And we'll realise that actually we can make really good housing if we think about design rather than just spending lots of money. So what that also has done is not that I get paid a huge amount of money to do that. It's allowed my practice to be really focused on the buildings that it does. Yeah. So curiously, we don't win work because I've been on TV. We win work because we're really focused on the buildings that we do and what our skill set is, you know. And it's almost, well, it doesn't really happen. People don't phone me up because they're because I'm on TV, they want a building. People come to us because they see buildings that we've designed they like and they want a building that's, you know, um, has that sort of spirit. Mm. And generally, I don't take on projects where they just want that person off the TV anyway, because... It's not going to be the right relationship. It always goes wrong, and it's not the right relationship. You know, actually, I'm not that person on TV. I'm a different person. I'm an architect with a practice, with that hat on, and I have to be different. Mm. Um, so I'm quite careful about what projects I take on as Invisible Studio. And the, the sort of backbone of an income that telly has given me has meant that the practice can really focus on doing really good work and building a portfolio of work that is really thorough very good and has its own story yeah and and with your sort of entry point into into television was that something that you said the bbc approached you or was it was it an idea for a show that somebody had already had or was it your idea or how, yeah the how bbc had this idea i mean they approached me and i think i'd done you know, a few buildings that, you know, architecture is a very small world in some ways. If you do a couple of good buildings, getting published is really important as an architect. Yeah. And that, you know, you need to get your work out there. And what's great about the internet is that everyone can put their work out there now. And I think I just finished the, the caretaker's house at Hook Park, which was a, a kind of prototypical low cost dwelling. And it was built for, you know, 170 grand out of materials that existed around you know, that context. And I built my own house as well, actually, that, that won the AJ Small Projects Award. And, um, and I, doing those two projects in particular, actually, were things the BBC picked up on when they had an idea for a show that was the house that 100K. It was a kind of modest design. It was the antidote to grand designs. And I think they, they started filming just with Kieran, and then they realised pretty quickly that they wanted an architect that could um, provoke change. Mm. Because the... The story in this instance was that people were building really ordinary things and we came in to try and make them better. So Kieran would give the backstory about how other people had done equivalent things and he would take the people off to see other things and I would actually say to people, actually, you've got this is your plan. If you do these things, you can make it better. Or this is your section, you can do these things. Or if you change these materials, you'll make it better. Kieran would then kind of help them understand where that sat alongside other projects that they could go and visit. And, you know, that was, that was fun. I didn't ever solicit it, but I was, in a way, my instinct as an architect has been to say yes to things yeah. and then to see where it might take me, yeah. know, to try and make the best of it. And that, in a way, has served me quite well in, in those contexts. And, and also it kind of is part of your being an educator as That's well. Right. And, Education and, is really important. I mean, I've loved teaching over the years. You know, I've taught for kind of 15 or 20 years. I've taught around 30 at Bath. I ran a unit at Cambridge with Meredith Bowles. I taught in the graduate school at the AA, you know, the Design and Make programme. And I have taught at the University of Reading and various other places and set up our own summer school, which is now, you know, 15 years old, Studio in the Woods. All of those things have been incredibly important mm. because 
it has meant that, in a way, all of that led to me really again winning the work at Hook Park, which was still the most interesting work I've done in some ways, which was truly sort of groundbreaking in terms of the materials, the techniques, the construction, but also in the model of using students as part of the design and construction team. You know, so it enabled us, it enabled us a mechanism of thinking very differently about how you could design and build a project, actually, and what your role as an architect was in that. Yeah. And, you know, the projects I did at Hook were ones that I, I changed from tutor to um, uh, to architect to, to sort of executive architect, and in then one case, design architect. And actually, it gives you a way of working that I've then used in other projects. So we built primary school projects with primary school kids because it's meant that we're not frightened of you know bringing in people other people to the project that might help us design and build. You know, we've won explicitly one work in primary schools, designing and building new buildings for them because of the way we've been involved in education mm. historically. And here, you know, this university, we built three pavilions for them right. with students. And those have been very good for us as a practice, but also they've been a very good model for the school, for the students to be able to realize a live project. Mm. And that's using me as Invisible Studio as designer and contractor, not as... Um, just a teaching fellow. It's a sort of interesting model of, sort of hybrid model of practice and education, I think, which is interesting. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on how education is currently serving, uh, you know, the, the next generation of architects and preparing them for professional practice? And is there enough discussions about the kind of architect that you want to be at the end of your education? In... I don't think there is, no. I mean, I think that part one, I think, is pretty good. Yep. I think general architectural studies at part one is a good immersion into the world of architecture. I think the problem with part two is that it's more of the same. And it's still this model that, you know, you're going to be Peter Zumta and actually everything else is kind of second best. But, <laughs> but I think you need to know about how you can be entrepreneurial, how you can set up a practice, how you can win work, how you can do work, how you can be reactive to things, how you can be more from just that lone hero sitting alone in an office waiting for the phone to ring. Yeah. Because it is the most disempowering thing, coming out of six years of architectural education, waiting for the phone to ring, realising over a period of probably 10 years the phone isn't going to ring, and then thinking, shit, how am I going to do something differently? And by then it's come too late. So you go and work for somebody else and then you think, God, my life could have been different. <laughs> That's the model, really. And, I, and, I, and it's not that um, people aren't able to set up a practice, it's that nothing in our education really allows us to be more propositional and more um, self sort of generating in mm. terms of the work that we do. It's interesting as well because it... it in, in lots of ways, it, for me, it feels so natural for architects to be yeah. propositional exactly. and self-generated. And that's what we do. We, we, exactly. we look at space, we look at sites, we come up with ideas. Exactly. And it just seems like a business or having those ideas become real and having to facilitate the relationships. And because it's serving a very singular vision, that's and right. often, often that's, and that's the great starting point for any business that it's, I, you know, this, the, there's, a, there's a kind of myth that architects are bad at business. And I really yeah. don't think that's... No, True, because it's, no. it, I think it's actually a natural part of it architecture. Is. Because what we do is so complex. You know, we don't just sit in a room making shapes. We bring in all sorts of people. We curate that conversation. We navigate around all sorts of things with incredible complexity. We manage risk. We envisage the future. All of those things. We really are motivated in making it happen because we want to build something. And we're incredibly motivated as individuals. And all of that often is kind of thwarted. And, but anyone who survives six years of education intrinsically has those things. And yet we don't really know how to use them effectively. So I think actually practice is changing quite fast now. You know, if I look at younger practices now, I see a different model than I did 20 years ago. I mean, what worries me is that 20 years ago, I see the kind of practices that existed 20 years before that, 20 years before that. I think there, are, there is a difference now. I think Assemble are different. I think they're doing things differently. I think um, other practices are rethinking um, how they teach, how they work. You know, the two things are more married. There are hybrid models of diploma units come practice. Mm. People are self-initiating their own work, Baxendale, you know, people like that. And I think there is a big change, actually. I also think that the 
cost of studying architecture, you know, cost you 100 grand to be an architect, you'll never earn 100 grand unless you're very lucky, has meant that people are really thinking about what part two is. And I think the apprentice model is a really good one where you go and work in practice for your part two and you just see the cut and thrust of practice. It may not be an ideal practice, but it's, it's seeing how different the conversations are. And also you see the breadth of things you need to understand if you're going to make a building happen. Mm. You know, you can't just focus on what shape it is, what color it is. You've got to, if you're going to see that thing at the end with your name on it, you have to do so many things to make that thing happen. You have to be so agile to kind of make that thing happen. Planning wise, building ranks wise, cost wise, client expectation, yeah. all that stuff. And you, you pick up that stuff in practice through osmosis. But at architecture school, you're never really made to understand how hard it will be to, you know, to get something built or, to, or what all the other skills that you will need are. And even in practice, no one really talks about them. You just kind of pick them up, you know. Well, what, what do you think are the benefits to practices having apprentices? I think um, young, fresh blood in practice is really important, you know. Um, I think being challenged by young people is really important. A constant, fresh set of skills that come in is really important. You know, seeing different ways of doing things is really important. And for me, you know, I, I mean, what's really interesting about design is that, you know, we almost never design something in its entirety and then give it to somebody else to kind of document. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a conversation. And, you know, you'll sketch something and you'll say, how about this? Someone else will say, yeah, we could do it like that. And, you know, every time someone else does something as part of your project, does a drawing, does a model, has a conversation, it changes and develops and moves and, you know. And I think I like the kind of anarchy of education is in that nothing is kind of sacred. You know, you can, you can challenge everything, really. And in practice, sometimes it becomes a bit stale. You know, you, you design a building that you've done before. But to have it challenged, I think, is essential to mm. any creative practice. Otherwise, you just wither and die. Yeah, brilliant. So what's next for Invisible Studio? What's next for Invisible Studio? That's a really good question. And I'd like to say that it's going to be different from things we've done before. So I think what's really good is that I've reached a point where I have, I think, curiously, you know, I felt for quite a long time that we were just scratching around in, with sticks in the woods and, you know, I wasn't going to do a serious project again. And, you know, and I, when we did Western Bird, you know, I kind of almost didn't put it in for an RIBA award. And I was kind of, is it any good? And, and I put it in and, you know, it won three regional awards. It won a national award. It was shortlisted for the Stephen Lawrence Prize. And then it was like, then my wife said, God, you're, you're really part of the mainstream now, <laughs> you know. And, but, but at the same time, it was a really important recognition that the things that we'd been doing were taken seriously. And although I'm kind of suspicious of awards like everyone else, it was really important to have that period marked. And I want now to, rather than just do more of what we've done, which are rural buildings with, um, you know, a group of people using their material, you know, I, I want to kind of expand it, make it kind of bigger somehow. I want to do bigger buildings that affect places more. So the project I'm most excited about well, the, the actual, then the simple answer to the question is, the next 10 years, I want to do the things I'm doing now, which are the seeds of the buildings we're doing now mm. are super exciting. Mm. So I've been working on a project for five years, four years in Somerset on the coast in the most deprived, no, it's the, it's the area of the United Kingdom with the least social mobility. You know, so if you're born poor, you stay poor. It's on the coast, it's a kind of neglected, you know, small town. And we're doing a series of buildings there, you know, seven million pounds worth of buildings, public money, that have taken four years to get to the point where we know what the buildings are. We're now in detailed design and that's going to make 37 jobs locally. So it has a very interesting economic model and a social sustainability model, but also the buildings are unlike anything in terms of scale I've done before, which is kind of really exciting. You know, they'll really affect a place. Um, and so we're doing bigger, you know, there's a whole series of bigger buildings we're doing now, which is great. The, the projects we've done have been really interesting but they've been relatively small scale mm. so i kind of want to upscale and make it move out into other contexts over the next five or ten years brilliant i look forward to i look forward to speaking again actually i'd love to come and uh, visit the studio and uh, i'd love that that'd be and, great uh, yeah be very welcome and, and see the context in which you're working because that'll give a, a, a more depth to everything you've said so absolutely fascinating thank you so much great thank you Rina. cheers so that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.